On the 3rd of April, 2022nd year, social networks of almost all countries shocked the world with horrifying photos that defy common sense. According to journalists, the photos were taken on the streets of the city of Bucha, and the perpetrators of those atrocities were Russian soldiers. The next morning, I published a post on the social network Instagram, expressing my condolences to the residents of Bucha and stating that the murderers of civilians will be judged by the just and terrible judgment of God. I received more than a thousand comments, hundreds of which, in an aggressive form, convinced me that all those shots were fake and the morning was staged. For my family, Butcha is not just a hero of the news feeds. We lived here for four unforgettable years, purchased a cozy one-room apartment in a new building, and I received a higher education at the Theological Seminary. And in general, we are connected with this city by many warm emotions and memories. I was sincerely convinced that photos do not lie. However, they say that in the era of information warfare, the only chance to know the truth is to hear the story from the first hands. That is why my friends and I decided to personally come to Bucha, communicate with eyewitnesses of those events, and use our camera to capture the real situation in what is now not just our native, but also a famous city. This movie is not like the others like it. Here, you will not hear any foul language. You will not see the brutality that you might see in other videos. We do not plan to fuel the already brightly burning fire of hatred towards the Russian people. Our goal is to convey real stories, or more precisely, the stories of survivors, which reveal the truth and help us understand the essence of what is happening. A few kilometers before reaching our destination, a rather sad and unprecedented sight appeared before our eyes. Everywhere there was scorched grass, severed high-voltage wires, shot cars, destroyed industrial buildings and shopping centers, looted stores and gas stations, residential houses with broken windows, broken roofs, and sometimes even cottages destroyed to the ground. But as it turned out, all these grim scenes were just a mournful prelude to the real horrors of post-war devastation. Moreover, the depth of the tragedy of war lies not so much in the ruins, but in the hearts of the surviving peaceful civilians who endured all this hell. Such horror. I don't know how I survived it. I was here. I can't walk. I'm in a wheelchair all the time. There was a battle here, on our Voxalnaya street. For about 500 meters, there were nine tanks. And if you go to the end of our street, then there, halfway down the street, there are no houses at all. About 10 houses are completely gone now. They were leveled to the ground. On the first day of the battle, this window was blown out. Part of the shell probably hit it. Then that window is blown out, and the doors were blown out, and half of the roof was blown off. The battle was so fierce that I found myself on the ground. Tanks were in front of my eyes. Our soldiers were fighting against them, hitting them. It was a horror that cannot be described in words. They shot from tanks, from guns, I'm telling you. My house was shaking like a house of cards for more than a month. I thought that I would be completely overwhelmed. There were battles, and they also shelled Erpen. And it was already so dark, I lie down and say, Lord, save and protect me. I hear something hit my roof. I crawled up to the attic and saw some kind of rocket or something. All I could see was something fiery flying towards my house. It was a miracle that I survived, and the house did not catch fire. On the other side of the house, all the ceilings are soaked with moisture, and when it rains, I lie there with water constantly streaming down on me. I have to cover myself with oilcloth to protect myself, and my couch is right underneath where the roof is damaged and leaking. I would never wish such a horror on my worst enemies if I had any. I was left cold, hungry, with no light, no gas, no medicine. 
I am hypertensive, I have sore legs, a sore spine, without medication it was so difficult, it's beyond words. I'm sitting in the kitchen, in this wheelchair, I hear bam, 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 knocking on the door with machine guns. So I didn't even go to the door, I was afraid. They went around the house, started knocking on this window, and two of them came up. One was in a Russian uniform, a tanker, and the other was wearing a regular jacket, a hat, and they both had automatic rifles. And I hear one of them saying to the other on the radio, I told you, you took a wrong turn, why? I think I will also talk to them in Russian, otherwise if they find out that I am Ukrainian, they will shoot me in the forehead, and that's it. I say, young people, what do you want? And he, we want to come and see you. I say, what do you want to watch from me? I live alone, there's nothing to see here. And he, what if someone is hiding here? Let's go in. Then I already started crying, desperately addressing them. Please go away from here, please leave this place. I said, God, give me death already. I can't live like this anymore. It's very hard for me. I want silence so much, so that no more shooting, no more flying shells, so that victory would come and silence would come, because my nerves can't stand it all anymore. There is no roof over my head anymore. When will there be one? This is the cold I live in, like on the street. There's oilcloth on the window, but it doesn't warm me at all. I've been living like this for over a month. I don't know how I stood it all. This is Voxelnaya Street in Buka. Every school day I rode along this street on my bicycle on my way to study at the seminary. Houses that delighted with their grandeur just a few months ago now appear in complete ruin and devastation. On both sides of the street, only rubble and ruins stretch, recalling former beauty and sadly testifying to irreversible changes. All these houses are familiar to me because I have been here every day, covering this route many times. Now, right now, you can see the cars that remain here, but the houses themselves no longer exist, as if they had been wiped off the face of the earth. For the sake of fairness, we want to note that there are those houses that, let's say, were lucky, God preserved them, they practically did not get them, they survived. There are houses where windows and roofs are broken, but there is no such devastation. And here, as you can see, the house is no longer subject to restoration. At the time of our visit, a tremendous amount of work had already been done by public utilities, private developers, territorial defense and volunteers to clear the streets of the remains of military equipment, corpses of Russian soldiers and local civilians. However, by comparing the famous photographs taken by journalists immediately after the fighting with the video footage captured by our lens, you can be sure that this is the same location. How are you? Did your house get a little bit of it? Yes, they robbed us, took everything they could from the house, even took an old mirror, took our cell phones. Have you personally not been subjected to violence? I've been exposed to it. They wanted to shoot me. You? Yes. I managed to escape thanks to an officer whose uncle served in the Pacific Fleet, just like me. Thanks to this connection, I managed to avoid danger and save my life. Otherwise, they would have killed me near the fence for the convoy of military equipment that I photographed. That column with the letter V that our soldiers smashed. That's why they wanted to shoot me. It just happened. Some people got hit hard, while others got nothing. Some houses are still standing intact and no one touched the people there, while some people were killed. There are probably still those who believe that all the photos of blown up tanks and cars in Butcha are fake. After all, where could such a large amount of scrap metal be disposed of so quickly? For you, the following frames will become especially valuable, but for us, it has become a real psychological shock, leaving a deep mark in our memory. We find ourselves in the midst of ruins, surrounded by the remnants of military equipment. This is not just a warehouse, it is a kind of storage where everything left after the military actions on the streets of the city of Bucha is transported. Unfortunately, amidst the ruins, we see ordinary cars of people who were desperately trying to leave the city. This horrifying sight gives us a chill as a picture of fear and hopelessness unfolds before us. We notice the inscription, children, on the vehicles, although the vehicle is completely shot up. 
Sometimes on such vehicles, after destruction, we see the inscription, no passage in Russian, left, probably, after all this transport was attacked. Journalists from different countries come here. In the 20 minutes that we have been here, we have already seen journalists from Poland, Italy, the United States of America, from our national television, Ukrainian television. And I suppose that this place will continue to be filled with an increasing amount of exported and destroyed equipment and vehicles. It's truly a terrible sight, friends. We recommend not to waste time on illiterate comments as if this is a warehouse of tanks from the Second World War. Even a schoolchild knows that under the influence of fire, after an explosion, all the varnish and paint comes off from military and civilian vehicles, as a result of which the metal is exposed. Therefore, a few rains will be enough for the car to turn into something similar to what you see behind me. In fact, not all the consequences of the war had time to be taken to the dump. After all, in addition to the city's central streets, there are yards of private houses where many uninvited foreign bodies arrived during the brutal massacre. It all flew in. Here it is, all this wreckage. That's exactly what happened. Over there, you can even see their clothes. Part of it was only found today. We were in the cellar at the time. Wow, look at that. Their belongings are lying around. We throw them away. They put on our shoes, took our new t-shirts, socks. We saw that they were walking around the yard. They had already been to the neighbors for one night, and in the morning, they came to us. They stopped over there where there were two houses. Neighbors ran to us, and they moved into those two houses. We sat all night, afraid to move. They were there with thermal images and flashlights. And the next day, they started bringing in the equipment. And someone knocked on our door. The men were taken outside. Life flashed before our eyes. We imagined what would happen next. We had already heard. I have a son. He is 18 years old. Phones and SIM cards were taken away from everyone. The phones were cleaned. And then they were also broken. Even when we were walking along the road, mines were exploding nearby. It seemed as if they were shooting at us because we could hear it on the fence. We pressed ourselves against the fence, screaming, there was no one on the streets. We have already recovered a little. Now it is a little easier to talk about all this. But then it was very difficult for us. The first time we did not sleep, nightmares tormented us. In short, it affects the psyche a lot. And it all just lay there? Yeah, it's still there. When it came in, I'm telling you, it was flying here, tearing them to pieces. Did something get in here, in your garage? No, it didn't hit the garage. Right here, when the battle was going on and we were sitting in the basement, they drove down the street ahead, then our military men met them there. Then they turned around and here was one amphibious combat vehicle, here was the second, the hatch burned under it, and there was an infantry fighting vehicle. For about 10 or 15 minutes, maybe, that's how it seemed to us in the basement. They were standing and gassing, standing and gassing here on the spot. And then as all this shooting started, the whole street started exploding. Then ours were hitting from Bayraktar, I guess, and our territorial defense was hitting them here down the street. They were hitting them hard and shrapnel started flying across the roof. But thank God, not a single burning piece of shrapnel hit. The scariest thing is burning shrapnel. These houses immediately caught fire. The garage door blew out and it immediately burned down. The worst thing is that houses started to burn. We immediately started calling the firefighters. They were still fighting. Everything was exploding. There were a lot of shells. The soldiers we saw seemed so young. They were barely 18 or 20 years old. Honestly, I really feel sorry for these young people. Why don't their parents show more compassion and prudence towards them and try to protect their children from such danger? As for me, I could never send my child to war in a foreign country. It is something incomprehensible to me. It is impossible to understand how parents can make such a decision and put their children's lives at risk. They found our spray can. It was lying in the table of Sasha, our son, and they began to draw this on the wall. And I thought they drew it with their own. This is the inscription we can see on the wall. 
Probably, this inscription was the final message left by the guys in their lives. Also, for some reason, they placed the mouse pad in this way. They put it here. What they wanted to show by this, we still didn't understand. It was a mouse pad for the computer that our son uses. This is purely for the sake of reasoning. We still do not understand the true meaning and intentions embedded in this action. When all this was exploding, all this horror was happening. Pieces of their bodies, arms, legs, heads were flying out of the enemy soldiers. The level of destruction and the consequences of the explosions are just horrifying. And we spent another two days cleaning it all up here. Our territorial defense came here, collected the bodies of our dead, while their authorities just left their dead lying around. Rules of engagement and fire control. Of course, these rules did not help the enemy soldiers. My son looked at this book. He says there is nothing special in it. Enemy soldiers carried such educational material on conducting combat operations with them. It is said that there is no war without looting, although everyone has a different idea of this dishonorable process and its consequences. To tell the truth, we ourselves were shocked at how much the lawlessness of looters can vary. Several times they came to us, broke everything here, of course. They climbed in through the window here, opened the doors, completely destroyed everything here. It's awful. They took everything out of the cabinets here, especially where women's jewelry was. It may be unpleasant to hear this. However, broken store windows cannot be compared with the destruction that the so-called liberators left behind while living in the apartments and houses of ordinary Butcha residents. Right now, we are in one of the houses in the town of Butcha, which is actually located very close to the place, to the house where we lived with our family. It is difficult to convey in words all the horror and destruction left behind by the occupiers, which we see here. This terrible sight reminds us of the terrible moments experienced by local residents. Take a look at this, friends. The logic of an adult can be enough to fit into one's head and try to understand why people disfigured by sin, holding a machine gun in their hands and feeling momentary superiority, feel a vicious desire to profit from someone else's property. However, what is the point of someone resorting to such reckless behavior that leads to chaos and destruction? Or what's the purpose of smashing a TV if you don't want to take it back for yourself? Over time, we've partly heard the answer to that question. For them, it is a wonder how it is that people living on the first floor have a toilet, a bathroom, TV sets so big. For them, it is a miracle. They were so jealous. A woman, whose house is located opposite, says that at one moment a tank drove up to her and they started shooting at Kyiv from it. She asked them to surrender, but the answer was, how can we surrender? Fifteen years in prison await us. We are contract soldiers. There is no way to go back. Of course, envy and hopelessness are like a lit match, ready to ignite the darkest sparks inside a person, highlighting his basest qualities. And unfortunately, this mixture is present in many Russian soldiers. However, in our search for the truth, we have realized that even in these horrors of war, we cannot cut everyone into one mold. We do not condone the atrocities in Butcha and other cities in our country that were and are under occupation. But as Christians, and simply as thinking citizens of Ukraine, we want to remind you that not all Russians are inhumane. You'll understand the basis for that opinion shortly. In the meantime, it's time to find out what fate has befallen my personal living space. These are the windows of my one-bedroom apartment in the city of Butcha, where my family and I arrived before the start of full-scale war on the 24th of February. We made the decision to stay here, as it seemed that it would be much safer here than in Kyiv, where we were before. And my wife was still begging me, she said, let's stay, because the children are tired, because we left Kyiv at 5 o'clock in the morning. The inner urge was to get out of here, and thank God that I responded to that inner voice. Although, to tell the truth, at that moment, I distinctly remember that the sounds of shells and gunfire in Hostomel, the nearest town, were so loud that their echoes could be heard everywhere. People were walking around, sort of, outwardly not even worried, hoping that all this grief, this misfortune would pass by. 
but thank God we left, friends. Even here, even though the windows of this house are intact, no shells have hit, but the atmosphere here is very unpleasant, to say the least. Frankly speaking, it was not only unpleasant to enter the entranceway, but also dangerous because of the horror stories of accidents with abandoned stretch mines that could explode at the slightest touch. Fortunately, the way to the second floor is short, however, what we saw there initially, to put it mildly, greatly upset us. Unfortunately, even though everything looked pretty normal from the street, being here on the floor, we can see that the situation is much sadder and more depressing than anticipated. We move cautiously and carefully, taking into account the possibility that the enemy may have left behind various traps and dangerous objects. We are now approaching our apartment number 149. We immediately notice that the door of the apartment is broken. As you can see, those who got here before us made an effort to temporarily seal and lock the doors, having previously secured their space. This is our first visit to this apartment since all the events that began on February 24th, and so far it seems pretty safe at the moment, although we are still cautious and remain on our guard. We probably had people living there. Here we are in the bathroom. Thank God there's no sign of maximum aggression from the enemy. The only thing they did was tear the curtain. But it's good to see that everything else is intact. Nothing is broken, all the glass is intact, and in general, everything is fine here. We're not gonna open any drawers in there. It's not safe. Oleg, we left this when I slept here. Yeah, I remember that. Apparently people entered the apartment through the window because you can see signs of that. I don't know if the camera will show it, but in fact, there are clear signs of people here. Apparently, they first decided to climb through the window and then probably used force to break the door down and leave the room through it. This is just a guess, but most likely, this is exactly what happened here. Yeah because they wouldn't have broken down those doors like that on the other side. You see that? Well, I don't know who was here or what they were looking for. There were some people who apparently wanted to find something valuable, but fortunately, they didn't manage to find anything and the apartment remained undestroyed. God is certainly to be thanked for that. This is a very important moment, my dear friends. I want to emphasize once again that we were here, in this place, on the 24th of February, together with our entire family, my mother-in-law, my children, my wife, and also Nazar, who is currently filming us. We came here with the intention of staying and continuing our life here. Then, we went to our friends. Perhaps now, we will also move into this house. Everything around was filled with noise, shooting, it was very scary. We decided to go down to the basement, just in case. And then, I want to emphasize once again that under God's guidance, we gathered all our things, packed the cars, and set off on our way from here. Now we see that all the cars that were left here are standing with broken windows, pharmacies here are broken, benches are overturned. In general, it was not easy here. Even in all likelihood, a tank drove into the courtyard here, because there are footprints. Therefore, we thank God excessively that He has kept our apartment and our lives from this danger. And from the bottom of our hearts, we express our condolences to those who were not so lucky. As a matter of fact, so do most of the apartment owners from the neighboring apartment complex, which is literally 50 meters away from our house. As you can see, the picture here is much sadder. My children left on the third day, and I was here for 16 days. This is my home. To be honest, I was angry that circumstances and anyone in general were kicking me out of my own home. I didn't want to go anywhere. Did your apartment suffer damage? Of course, everyone suffered. Look, not a single window intact. It was such a beautiful complex. We had children running barefoot here, because the yard was cleaned every day. My granddaughter used to run here. And now it's just awful. We've been sweeping for two days, and by the second day I was so desperate to clean, but it's not doing any good. Yes, it is scary to imagine how many families who have saved for years for their own homes have lost everything overnight. Among them, there are many people dear to my heart. 
One of these houses belongs to a very close friend of mine, but unfortunately, he is currently absent. However, here is his neighbor who has kindly agreed to meet us and show us around. Greetings, Alexander. Which one of these houses is yours? It's this one, isn't it? First of all, please accept our condolences. Even though it is material, as they say, the soul is still invested here. We have strived for this all our lives. Yes, I understand, and my condolences. It's best not to touch it with your hands. It's been touched on before. This is such a problem. This is what it looks like. Some of its parts, we, as they say, are not experts in this. Well, let's take a closer look at this situation together. Here, among the ruins, you can still see the remnants of the comfort that once reigned here. Some chairs have survived without being completely destroyed, and although they may show small holes and damage, they still retain their appearance and can be restored. Now, if possible, we will now show what the appearance of this place was like before the start of the full-scale invasion. The family of my friends treated with great trepidation all the details of creating a truly warm home hearth. They invested not only finances here, but also their own efforts, time, and heart. They find consolation only in sincere faith and hope in God. This is probably the only way to survive such a test without becoming angry at the whole world and without falling into despair. Everything is clear here. Zhenya, God grant you the opportunity to build something new, no less cozy, beautiful, and dear to your family. To lose your home during a war, it is not necessary for it to burn down completely. If you are an elderly person living alone, even a leaking roof is enough for your house to slowly but steadily become uninhabitable. You are not able to patch the roof on your own, but expecting help in the current situation is akin to a great miracle, because everyone here has their own troubles. This shell landed here and was left lying there. Everything here is destroyed, water has flooded the floor, and there are basins in every corner of the room. They are in the kitchen, in the bathroom, in other rooms, in short, everywhere. This is only part of the horror that has fallen upon the place. Here, at this spot, there was a tank. Another tank was placed on the opposite side. They occupied this place. At first, they drove past our house like this, heading towards the neighbors. Right on the tank? Yes. They drove right through the tank. Here are the tracks. See? Everything was blocked off there. And yet, they drove back and forth through this obstacle. This is just one of the testimonies of the events that unfolded here. Thinking back to that day, we were first approached by two people. They broke the window, and at that moment, we were just sitting there, engrossed in watching TV. We turned around to see what was going on. One of them pointed a machine gun at us. The shock we felt at that moment cannot be conveyed in words. Even now, after a while, these feelings have not completely subsided. The emotions of anxiety can still be felt. The body is overcome by weakness, and sometimes you just want to cry it all out. You know, now even ordinary noise, for example, cars passing nearby, gives the feeling as if a tank is driving nearby.
A military man came to us, climbed in, carefully examined the entire room and came to the conclusion that nothing should be touched. The reasons for his decision remain a mystery to us. He came in, kind of modest, with a machine gun. He asked me, do you have cell phones? This question only added to the tension and uncertainty. And I'm old, no, I wasn't scared, there was no fear, I was calm, I just didn't immediately understand why he needed our cell phones. I took out the mobile phones, my husband's and mine. The military took them and completely destroyed them, even though there were no messages or any important information in them. Why was this done if there was nothing in them? Thank goodness that not only cell phone service is already established, but also a serious supply of groceries that regularly arrive in Butcha by dozens of trucks of all sizes. As you can see, humanitarian aid is coming in huge quantities, my friends unloading a truck at the local church in Butcha. This shows that people are willing to donate and be involved in helping those in need. Praise God for such people. The main thing is to know exactly what the residents of this city need. We will do everything possible to identify their needs, as preliminary research has shown that many products are already abundant for them. Can you tell us what prompted you to come here from Venezia, a relatively quiet, peaceful city? First of all, I love to help. It makes me happy to do good to people without expecting anything in return. It's just peace for the soul. I know that people need help here more. There is a lot of devastation here. All this needs to be cleaned up. Someone has to do it. I'm ready. After such inspiring volunteer shades, let me thicken the colors for a few minutes. Perhaps not all compatriots will understand us, and maybe it will sound extremely unpatriotic. However, as part of the information war, it was fundamentally important for us to double-check, having heard from eyewitnesses, whether there really were killings of civilians here, or whether all this was just a fabrication by professional Ukrainian journalists. Young soldiers wearing student badges walked the streets, asking local residents where grocery stores and other places were. I communicated with them, even asked them for cigarettes, tried to establish contact, hoping to create adequate communication and ask them not to bother us. Have many people on your street been affected by the criminal actions of the occupiers? The houses are destroyed, there are no casualties. Only there a 40-year-old man was killed, leaving behind two children. They put a machine gun under the husband's throat and said, you have one minute to lay out all sorts of radio transmitters of some kind, weapons. The husband says, what are you guys doing? We are ordinary people, we just live here, we cook food, our children are at their grandmother's house. And two people found themselves locked in rooms where they were subjected to fear and psychological pressure. They managed to survive, which is a true miracle considering the possible outcomes. After all, as my husband says, death in such situations is not uncommon. Our parishioner's daughter was killed. I was just horrified. How could we run? Because so many people died in the streets. The woman in the school was found, but not the same day she was killed. When the Russians were walking, they started shooting at the school, and that's when they started killing. After a thorough check of the documents, they returned them to their owners. However, they seized the phones for further inspection. If anything suspicious was found, the phones were destroyed. We saw people lying here, women buried there. We saw it, but we thought it was an accident. And we ran across like that, quickly, quickly, so that we wouldn't be shot. On Yablonskaya Street, perhaps up to 20 corpses were found, and at the base of the compound, there were 10 corpses, tentatively. Even when we went to get food, when we were walking back, we saw a bicycle lying around, then another, then a scooter. And the neighbor said, they were all killed, the corpses were lying, his son-in-law was killed in these neighbors, and he also lay on Yablonskaya Street for a long time. Just like that, a man rides a bicycle, he is killed, and that's it. 
This house, my dear friends, has been my home for over three years during my studies at the seminary. Here, I have accumulated many wonderful memories, and I am grateful to God that this house remains intact and undamaged. Here, literally opposite, the fence didn't have much luck, but that's minor. The main thing I wanted to say, friends, let me take you down this street to then move on to the next one, which, unfortunately, has witnessed many tragic events that have taken place since the beginning of Russia's full-scale invasion and claimed the lives of innocent civilians. This street became famous thanks to photos posted on the internet. Let's take a closer look at this place. Here, friends, we have come out onto this street, Yablonskaya in Bucha, formerly known as Kirova Street. Here it goes from there and further across the intersection. Here, in this place, we are confronted with the aftermath of the tragedy. Although the bodies have already been removed, the area has been cleaned up, but this site leaves a serious impression, a very, very eerie feeling from being here. According to all local residents who stayed here during the war and witnessed its horrors, this street saw the most tragic incidents among the civilian population. They claimed that the most terrifying events took place right here. People were killed on scooters, on bicycles, and also while simply doing their normal everyday activities, for example, going to the grocery store. This street is of particular importance to me, as I used to head there daily to the forest store. The accounts of all these horrors cause me deep anxiety and fear. War, my friends, is all war. It brings with it loss and destruction. Are you on Skladzavodskaya? Yes, that's correct. Have you personally had the opportunity to witness or hear about cases where peaceful civilians were shot? Yeah, we heard it. When we came out of the entrance, this terrible shooting started, the sounds of which could be heard everywhere. Every day, two or three people died in these terrible events. It was unbearable. Our acquaintances who lived next door to us were killed there. I think their bodies were taken away yesterday or the day before yesterday, dug up. Can you share information about the reasons that prompted them to commit such acts? Perhaps they had some motives, such as resistance from people, or something else explains their actions. No, there was nothing, no resistance. They were ordinary people, civilians. That's where an elderly man was killed, across from the third school on our side. He was walking his dog after curfew, around 7 or 8 o'clock in the evening. When he ran after the dog, he was shot. One bullet in the shoulder, one in the stomach. They brought him here to the drugstore, put him down, then the men went to bury him. In that area, seven graves were found, and the bodies have already been exhumed. Additionally, across from the merchandise stand on the other side, in the middle of the night, an unknown sniper shot a man around 40 years old, without anything, without any identification documents. He had 30 hryvnias in his pocket. Direct hit to the head, brains out, half his head was missing. It was very dangerous to be on that side. Either from the school you could be shot by snipers, or from the continent construction site. We took a 50-meter rope, a hook, hooked it, turned it over, hiding behind the trucks, in case a man was lying there on a grenade or on a stretching rod. We wrapped the body of the deceased in a carpet, dug a grave, and buried him there. I'm sorry, but have you personally seen the corpses? Yeah, we saw it with our own eyes. We were here when it was happening. We almost became victims, like many others. We almost got run over by a tank. Right underneath this house, we saw a tank that was standing here. Here in that house, on the first floor, they would often go out on the balcony to spend time and probably smoke. Sometimes we could see two officers resting on the balcony, and the corner house, a few steps away from them, served as a tank parking lot. On the way here, in this direction, we noticed many bodies, and all of them were shot in the head. These were ordinary civilians who died as a result of this terrible tragedy. However, the occupants did not even give us the opportunity to bury the bodies. Behind the intersection, children on bicycles were also shot. Their bodies had already been taken away. The family was shot. Husband, wife, and two children. There, in the alleys and on Gorky Street, there were also corpses. In this building, on the fourth floor, lived a family who every day dressed in peculiar white outfits and went to their mother-in-law. And so, literally before our soldiers were supposed to arrive, the wife from this family was mercilessly killed by a sniper. 
The husband wanted to take his wife's body, and they stripped him naked, looked at the tattoos. Maybe there was something written on the body, you know? Well, they are sick people, I tell you. The husband of this woman survived and returned here later, bringing his daughter with him. She was a wonderful woman whose kindness and compassion were known to everyone. The sniper who committed the murder did not spare her and shot straight into her head. They lived here, on the fourth floor of this house. There is now information circulating among Russians that all these events were organized and staged and that the corpses were brought to the site by the Ukrainian military. What can you say about this? No, no, it's not staged. It was right in front of our eyes. We saw it all. We were under occupation, surrounded. We didn't leave here. We ourselves collected the bodies of those they killed with their shots. There can't be any montage or staging. It's all unconditional truth, the undeniable reality that we faced. From the very beginning, we didn't aim to make this video psychologically heavy. And in fact, we purposely don't show you some hard shots. However, being there in the place, curiosity got the better of us, and we decided to go to the house in which, according to eyewitnesses, really terrible things were happening. Even at the entrance to the courtyard, we sensed a particularly gloomy atmosphere. The ajar doors of one of the cellars of this house immediately caught our eye. The newly congealed blood on the basement steps and the bullet casings suggested that something bad had really happened here. The metal doors to the basement were ajar by about five centimeters, but we were afraid to go inside, first, for fear of stretch marks, and second, we were really uncomfortable with what we might see there. The thirst for truth, or simple human curiosity, prevailed and I began to seek an additional way for relatively safe door opening. Suddenly, we heard a voice. We want to go down to the basement. On what basis do you want to go in there? To make a video. Are you from this house? No? So why are you poking around in someone else's basement? Anyway, we never managed to get into the basement. Who knows, maybe God himself saved us from some really unpleasant consequences. There was a situation, it was March 22nd. Our men went out of the entrance to cook. Four soldiers came here. Our boys had cell phones. By the way, about the phones, I wanted to show the following. As far as I understood, they destroyed all the phones, right? It is interesting to note that almost every resident of Butcha who survived the occupation mentioned that Russian soldiers broke or burned the phones of local residents. The Russian soldiers did everything possible to ensure that there was no photo and video evidence of what was really happening in Buka. Were you filming anything? No, because I have a phone without a camera. Those who filmed are already in the afterlife. The occupiers checked everything. However, we did manage to locate one person who was able to capture some footage of actual fighting taking place at the time. Is that from the entryway? Yes, we were sitting near the elevator, and we were able to take pictures from there. It was just that everything was still exploding, they were still working. We were still sitting in the entrance because the safest place was near the elevator. There were load-bearing walls on at least two sides. Two... I just saw that the technique was coming, and I started looking for a place where I could see. When I found the place, I filmed it on camera. Now I'll get closer. These are the first shots when they came in, and this video is the second frame when they started working on them. 30 tanks? I counted 30 pieces of equipment, and a third of them remained here somewhere. As it happened, the artillery did not miss there, of course. It's just that when a combat kit exploded in a tank, and this is the entire supply of shells, then the roar was so loud that it seemed that a 10-story building jumped under you. And apparently, then it flew home. One caught fire and then spread to two more. During the battle, I went out and looked to see if our house was on fire. I was worried because then you can't evacuate. You have to think of something. Well, that's how it was here, really as if I had been in the 41st year without any exaggeration. We don't know about the 41st, but anyway, it's hard to imagine how it rattled here, if even with a falling shell a few kilometers away, which my children and I heard personally on the first day of the war, it was terrifying. And here, an explosion is happening right under your house. And by the way, 
The real danger of shells is not where many people think. Allow me to illustrate one important point in this regard. This is my friend's apartment from the inside, and I want to show you its condition. In general, everything is fine here, nothing seriously damaged in the apartment. A few windows were broken, but we've already taped them up. However, there is one interesting thing that I want to tell you about in this connection. When you initially think about war, you think that this is something related to some kind of explosions directly in the house, for example, and for civilians it is scary, terribly frightening. We want to visually demonstrate the damage that can be caused by an exploded shell, which detonated just tens of meters away from the house. The shell did not cause the house to catch fire, and also did not pose any explosion threat to the building itself. But I would like to draw your attention, friends, to this fragment. It's not just plastic, it's a metal shard that, as you can see, has infiltrated this area. That's right, Sasha. Did he fly into the room from here? Most likely, this shard flew into the apartment from there, broke a piece here and hung on this tool. We'll now demonstrate how it was stuck in this tool from the very beginning so you can see what it looked like. Pay attention to the place where it flew from. Please pay attention here. Look at this. Here, at this specific location, please carefully examine, there is a car standing, and near the car, or what's left of the car after the explosion of a projectile nearby, fragments of the mailbox of the company, Nova Poshta, are scattered. And this metal fragment flew from there, my friends, imagine. There's a crater there, by the way, it's visible from here, maybe we can take a closer look at it, here's a shell crater. Everything seems to be fine there. We took another look, well, nothing terrible happened. But look what's happening. So, my friends, by the way, by the way, this probably small fragment flew through the curtain here, right? No, that's the other one, and here it is on the wall. So, we can say that there is no global destruction here, the house is intact, the walls are standing in place, however, this environment is a serious threat to life. Therefore, when sirens howl to signal an air raid siren, the best option for us would be to take shelter behind two solid walls. But if possible, an even better option would be to find a shelter designed specifically to protect against attacks. And here are also small fragments, which, unfortunately, hit other glass, other windows, and broke them. I mean, it's such a small thing you'd think, what can it do? It blows the window right off. There's more pieces of metal. Ooh, smells fresh. The window flies out easily, and if it hits a person, you know, it's not pleasant. And now, friends, let's come closer to the place where this shell exploded in order to carefully examine the remaining wreckage of the car that we talked about earlier. And pay attention, here, nearby, there is a broken Nova Poshta postal machine. Anyway, I'm not going to touch anything here. This fragment is 100% related to this place, to the parcel locker that we were talking about. And there, through that window, he flew to the place from which we had taken him. And here is the car of my friend, on which we have ridden several times, and you may remember it. We will try to find photos where it is depicted in its original condition, still intact. However, I would like to point out that, although it also suffered, but not to the same extent as the car standing next to it. They say it's not that hard to restore. Well, it's just what we're showing it for. Again, so that you can all see that these are not some made-up cars taken from somewhere else. No, everything here is just the way it was. Believe it or not, but as mentioned earlier, our main goal in creating this documentary film was not to provoke more hatred towards the Russian people. We deliberately aimed to once again draw your attention to the following important message. You cannot judge all Russians by the actions of the most inhumane of them. And no matter how strange it may sound, even those who directly went through all the horrors of Butcha spoke about it. You know, I'll tell you the truth. We even ran in white bandages to the hospital to get medicine. Russians came here. They are really different. We had a roadblock here, and here too. So they were very loyal, very loyal.
We even asked them, why did you come here? Who are you looking for? And they answered us, we came to defend the Russian world. I said to them, so every second person here speaks Russian. How could you defend this Russian world? Tell me, please, how did the Russian soldiers treat you, your neighbors and acquaintances? That's what it is. Tell me honestly. At this particular location, it was here that we watched as they came, spent time having drinks and then left. They offer us, let's go to Belarus, to Russia. And we told them, our roots and motherland are here. We were born here, and so were our ancestors. If we are destined to die, then we will die here. There is no need to protect us. Well, those first ones, you know, they were kind of human. I'm telling it like it is because, well, I have no complaints about them. They led us there to a nine-story building, opened the door and said, sit here, we will shoot, but don't come out. Then we asked, guys, let us go. There is no money. And one of the soldiers said, we would have left here ourselves, but we were sent to take Kyiv in two days. And another soldier said, I have a wife and a child waiting at home, and I don't want to stay here too long. However, we were sent here, and although we would have been happy to leave this place if we could have done it on our own, we understand that it is not possible now. Let's just say that we were very lucky that such soldiers came to us. It all depends on how you have been communicating with them. If you communicate normally and try to establish contact, the likelihood that they will start touching you is extremely low. I say this from my own experience. And if you start, as they call it, to behave very impudently, like, why did you come to our land? And so on, you start to anger them, then lie down with your hands tied and your head shot through. Our neighbor was also visited by these soldiers, three people, and her husband said to them, let us hide you, and you will surrender? You came here to die. Who are you defending here? And two soldiers agreed to this proposal to surrender, and the third did not want to. They said they will be searched all over the houses. They say, you are lucky that we are here. If Chechens, Kadyrov's soldiers, came to you, first a grenade would fly, and then they would come to your house. That's their words, that's the truth. That's what I personally heard. I think we were really lucky that they had common sense and humanity, and as a result, we were able to save our lives. Little one, you want something to eat, don't you, doggy? Friends, official information. If any of you feel the desire to help the town of Butcha and neighboring communities, you should be aware that there is an abundance of bread and food items ready for distribution. By the way, here's an interesting fact. While here in Butcha, we met a man named Alexander, who is a subscriber to our YouTube channel. He stumbled upon us by accident, so he has a car filled with all kinds of animal feed. This kind of help is especially relevant here, because there are a lot of domestic animals, as well as abandoned and stray animals here. Also, we are told that we need powders, soaps, and personal hygiene items. Alexander is a representative of the church that is located here next to us, which helps to find and deliver here the humanitarian aid that we told you about a little earlier. So indeed, thank God for the active participation of believers in helping. This is truly inspiring and gives hope. Direct eyewitness testimony, see? Timur, please tell me in general, where did you get the courage to go through all this? I don't know. Well, you have a very serious look. When I look at you, I think, perhaps after all the experiences, you no longer feel fear, right? Well, how can I not be afraid? I will, of course. Very serious guy. Did you hear a lot of rumbling around here? A lot of explosions? The heaviest explosions were when our defense forces drove them out of here. I see. Is that what your parents say? No? I got it. Did you go down to the basement to wait it out? Or were you always at home, in your apartment? In various situations, I found myself either in the stairwell or in the basement. When the shelling was most intense and our soldiers were pushing back the enemy, we would go to the basement. And when the situation calmed down, we would return back to the apartment. Did you hear the sirens? Did you go down to the basement when the sirens sounded? No sirens were heard. We didn't have sirens. There were supposed to be sirens all the time, right? Sirens. 
I remember when I was still living here, I thought how much the city was developing, how promising it was here. There is already an epicenter hypermarket. Everything is there, all the infrastructure. Right now, as you can see, the situation is far from the idealized picture that the local residents had in their minds. However, all those who have stayed here continue to nurture hope and faith that soon everything will be restored and returned to normal according to their expectations and plans. We all realize that rebuilding what was destroyed and returning to normal life will depend on how things develop further. And of course, as peaceful people, we turn to God in our prayers and hope that the Lord will spare our country from further devastation, torment, death and evil, and there will still be a time of peace on this earth. Tell me, what would you most want in the context of the whole current situation? What is your biggest dream as of today? I want the war to end. Well done, you're doing great. Well, he who has ears has heard, he who has eyes has seen. God grant everyone the wisdom to draw the right conclusions. As Christians, we would like to end this movie in a simple but unconventional way, namely, with a prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, we turn to you as our only source of hope for salvation and deliverance. Forgive our sins, forgive us when we wrongly blame you for our troubles. May the guilty be punished for their actions and the defenseless be protected. May justice be done and the wounds and hearts of those who have suffered be healed. May humanity be preserved in the hearts of men and may your love help those who have not yet found faith in you. Stop the war, O God. May peace come soon to our long-suffering land. But let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And most importantly, come soon, come to us soon, our Savior. Amen.